right. And then okay. I want to share the screen. Whenever you are ready, I'm ready. share so, the screen. Yep. Uh, uh, Andy America. So the yeah, bottom left. Yeah, we'll share everything and just yeah. just in case we're jumping around. All right. So guys, we'll go as slow as you want or as fast as you want. So I have some people in the room, I have some people not. So I'm kind of just sitting here to see my hand waving around and maybe I'll walk. But on the screen right now is what's called a loan estimate. So this is the first, this comes out to your clients when they purchase a home. This goes in part of what's called the disclosure package. So I chose, um, I chose some numbers that I felt were common for our area. Um, in New Jersey, in the Wayne area, uh, average purchase price, about 600,000 in our area. So if you look at this document, um, here, I'll, work, I'll actually work the mouse because then I can go here. Yeah, you did. Yeah. So I, I started out, I did up here, it said, oh, this is closing disclosure. I want to go to loan estimate. One wow. second. There should be another document. Oops, what do I do here? You do that. Let me see where that is. Go to Andy America down on the bottom. Yeah, that's where we are. Go scroll down there. Maybe that's the top one. And right. there's... So guys, I, you guys have it there. Perfect. Keep going because that's a loan. That's this closing disclosure. Oh, there's two of them. Right gotcha. Now. There you go. Okay, yeah, that's why. All right. So perfect. There we go. All right. So this is a loan estimate that you're looking at on the screen now. So I, if you see up here, it says loan estimate. And this is exactly how it looked like for a client. I mean, we chose Andy American, Sally America. But um, if you see here, this would be a conventional loan where the box is checked off. It was FHA, FHA be checked off for VA. Um, this is this this disclosure is a 30 year purchase. This is if they were locked in. So if somebody were looking at this and want to know if the rate was locked in, if the no box was checked and they got it from somebody else, then no, the rate's not locked in at the time of this document. And then it tells you when it was locked in and when it expires there. So I, we did it, um, it's locked in until 114, 2022 is how this was done. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's a six hundred thousand dollar sales price. Okay, with a 540 loan amount, I chose a rate of three and a quarter. The principal and interest is broken down on the first page of this. That's $2,350. And then it talks about here, this client, just to start from here. So when they go to the next page, $600,000 sales price, $540,000 loan, the client's paying PMI insurance. So when you, when you look at this, this is the mortgage insurance right here where my, where my hand is. And that $261 is what the mortgage insurance costs in this scenario. So I don't know what credit score we used put this together for me, it might've been a 740 credit score, but mortgage insurance is based off your credit score as well. So the lower your credit score, the higher that number would be. So what this is telling you with 10% down, the first seven years, years one through seven, the client would be paying mortgage insurance. Year eight through 30, that mortgage insurance would drop off. So the payment would change. The next, the next line underneath it is the escrow amount. So now you go down a little bit lower here and you see where it says 1320. And what's in escrow, yes, is checked because they're both in escrow. This would include the property taxes and the home insurance. So their total payment in the first seven years would be $3,931. After seven years, their pay, the PMI would automatically go away with a conventional mortgage. Um, and their payment would drop to $3,670 if all things stayed equal with the taxes and the home insurance. Okay? So... That's what you have here. Then here is a summary of the closing fees, which I'll, uh, this will be on the next page. And this tells the client how much money they need to purchase the house. Okay. So when you're looking at this document, and for those of you that are on the screen, if you have questions, you could type in the questions to the chat and then Kevin will help me how to read them and I'll come back to them. And then um, and anybody has questions in here, ask your questions because this is, I'm trying to, whatever everybody learn. So don't assume anything, ask a question. Um, so this is telling us that our client for this home with 10% down, so if you do the math, $600,000 sales price, 10% is 60 grand, plus the $18,392, they would need to purchase this home, $78,392. Does that include the $60,000? Yes, it does. Down? Yes, it does. So that's where the whole total comes from. Yes, sir. That's where the whole total comes from. So it includes the down payment and the, the, um, the closing fees. So now when you go through this document here, now we go to page two. So this is page one of three. It's a three page document. So now I go to page two and this is a breakdown of what your client gets. So this is not, this is not an NJ lenders form. This is a federal government form. So every lender in America uses this exact same format. 
Okay, so it's it's not different from one company to another. So that's why I think this is helpful to you guys. So these are our normal fees. So when you look at this document, we have our application fee, which is 1025. Um, we have an appraisal fee, credit report fee, flood certification fee, and tax service fee. So those are those. <coughs> fees. What's unique about this document is it actually adds up, doesn't add down. So these figures right here, 78, 11, 72, and 425 are in this shaded area. That's the total. Same with the 1025. It's in the shaded area. So these are these are generally what I refer to as when, when you talk to your client and they're shopping for a mortgage and they're comparing things, they'll always say to me, what are your fees? What are the total closing fees? And I'll explain it to them. I have a guy right now I'm working with and he's, well, your title charges are different than the other companies. And I explained to him, I don't handle title. I'm just responsible to give you an estimate. You have to discuss that with your attorney because every lender could use a different number. For, and that client, and he was dealing with another lender as well, didn't disclose an attorney fee to him. So it made it look like their closing fees were less. And I said, well, there's not an attorney fee on there. So you're not seeing that, but you do have an attorney. And his answer is, yes, I do. So people get, clients get confused because lenders will make it look like their fees are less when in reality, the, the fees you really want to compare when you're talking to your client are section A and B, because those are the lender fees. Mm -hmm. Those are what the bank or the lender is going to charge them. So, so that's section A, section B. Those are the lender fees. Now you scroll down here to section C, and these are the items you can shop for. Well, your client can shop for those things. They can call the title company. They can hire those people. But in North Jersey, where we do a majority of our business, an attorney handles all that for you. And title in New Jersey is regulated. So whether they go to ABC title company or XYZ title company, those fees are going to be within $100 of each other. Unless you have a family friend in the title business that's going to cut you a break and sweep something under the rug. So when a client questions that, ideally, they want to speak to their attorney about those charges. So and, and then the one fee that, that jumps out here is when you look at this. So these are some standard closing fees, closing service letter, EDOC now, endorsements to the title, lender's title insurance. What does lender's title insurance mean? Well, it's not my title insurance, but it's confusing to a client. It means lender, like you're insuring the mortgage, the mortgage amount. So that's why it says lender's title. And if you if you follow the hand, it goes over here to section H where it says owner's title. What does that insure? That insures your client's equity in the home. So God forbid there was ever a claim and it was more than $540,000. If you just had lender's title insurance, you, you fall short. You lose your equity because you didn't have your owner's portion of the title. So it says optional there, but it's not optional. It's, it's strange. <laughs> it's not optional. It's got, everybody gets it. It's required. Um, your attorney's going to tell you, if you don't get it, you're foolish. Let's put it that way. Because you're giving away your equity if God forbid a claim ever came about. So you have these mileage, notary fees, mortgage payoff satisfaction. When you pay off a mortgage, there might be a charge. Um, the notice of settlement filing things, searches and exams. That's the individual that goes out and does the search, the person that goes to the county court and looks things up or follows things online. Um, and then the big item here is settlement fee. So when you see settlement fee, you're, you're talking about, you have your attorney that's representing your client. But if you guys are not aware, in North Jersey, attorneys sometimes just represent our clients legally for all the legal guidance but they don't represent, they don't perform the actual exchange of money at the closing. So when they're, when they're doing everything, the title company is writing the checks to everybody involved. So, if the, so when you speak to your attorneys or your clients and you're referring your, your go-to attorney, you want to know if he is doing the closing or if the title company is doing the closing. Because when you disclose a fee, you may have an attorney that his fee is, look at, we didn't put a fee on here. Oh my, I didn't realize it. It would go here in section H and it would say attorney fee. And if it says 1200 and your attorney tells you he's charging 1200, he's probably charging less because he's really not, he's not doing the closing himself. So then what fee jumps less, on, what less, fee jumps onto your client? Less liability for the attorney. Less liability for the attorney. That's why they don't want to do it. This 525 charge is called the settlement fee. That's the closing agent from the title company going to the attorney's office, 
witnessing all the signatures. That gentleman, that individual can't give legal advice because he's not an attorney, but he can witness all your signatures. He has the right, he's a notary, so he can witness all your signatures. And that's the individual that writes all the checks out to the seller, to the to to all the, the to the lenders, all the parties involved. Now, <coughs> it's a question for the attorneys you refer because some attorneys will charge eighteen hundred dollars now, but they do the closing, so that five twenty five would go away. So again, when you disclose, when we disclose, we try to prepare them for worst case scenario. We always do put the attorney fee on here. I got to be honest with you; I don't know why it's not on here now, and I didn't review this. I got, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I'm looking at it for the first time. So even though I printed it, put it in here, I'm looking at it for the first time, but there'd be an attorney fee here. So now you go up to the top here and, and now you have in section E, you have what's called recording fees or other taxes. What happens when you go to a closing, when the deed and the mortgage document are signed, they get recorded with the county, somebody's closing it. The county charges a fee to do that. They charge so much for the first page and then so many dollars for every page thereafter. So depending on how many pages it is, is what it costs. The average is around 340. Now, the next item on here is called the transfer tax. Okay, so what is a transfer tax? Yeah, yes, 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 it's an old tax. So what a transfer tax is, when somebody sells real estate in the state of New Jersey, they pay what's called a realty transfer tax. Almost what I, I call an exit tax when you sell your house. You owe the state money. The money goes to the state of New Jersey. So 99% of the time, the seller pays this charge. We disclose it a lot of times when we don't have the purchase contract. So we disclose it at least 50% of the time when we don't have the purchase contract. Because if we're wrong and don't disclose it and your buyer is responsible to pay it, we become responsible to pay the day of closing if they're charging because we have a 10% tolerance on all the fees and that will exceed the 10%. So we never want to be responsible to pay $4,000 in this instance, you know, and, and that transfer tax is based off the purchase price. So you guys may or may not be aware of it. I'm, I don't know if your office has a tool to help when you're taking a listing, what people will pay when they sell a house besides the commission they pay the, the transfer tax, but your sellers pay a transfer tax when they sell your home. I, I'm pretty certain you can get it online. Talk to your office. I'm sure they can help you with that information. Talk to your attorney. Talk to your attorney. <laughs> but as you, when you're when you're going over what somebody's going to net from the sale of their house to purchase another house, that's a pretty big number. So I always take and plus they pay an attorney to sell their house. So I I'm jumping off the wagon right now onto when you take a listing. But you do want to have a conversation or understand, hey, they're paying a 5% commission, plus they're paying a transfer tax and they're attorney. So when I do the calculations, I always take an extra 1% off when I'm doing somebody who's selling and buying, when I do the math. So the transfer tax, like I said, 99% of the time, your buyers will not be responsible to pay. So the day of closing, that would come off the document. Okay, that would come off the closing disclosure. The next section is what's called prepaid items. So what are prepaid items? Those are the real estate taxes you pay at closing. That's the home insurance you pay in advance prior to closing. And then you have section G here, which is in the initial escrow. So this is all part of what's called prepaid items, taxes, home insurance, et cetera. So when your client goes to a closing, he is expected by every lender to pay his, to pay his first year in full for his home insurance. Pays that prior to closing. So that money's got to be paid directly to the insurance company, and then the insurance company provides the lender a paid receipt and what's called a declaration page. And then we approve that insurance to make sure that um to make sure that insurance uh uh enough for the house. So we make sure they have enough coverage. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Check. Uh we can't see your screen. Oh. We just Is lost it like oh. um it's still sharing. Thank you. Can you see it? No, it's just showing like all the pictures of people. Uh, yeah, it changed about two minutes ago. Yeah, it's still sharing on our end. Yeah, it's just showing the Zoom screen. I'm gonna stop and reshare it again. Any luck now? It's booting up something. Wow. 
why, why Kevin's doing that. Jacqueline asked the question, are points included in the loan cost? In this scenario, they are not. When the screen comes back up in section A, you will see where you see a percentage sign and loan amount points, and there would be a figure there. So if somebody were paying points, the number would be in there. So that's a good question. That's in the loan costs or the other costs? Loan cost, section A. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. You'll, 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 if, they had, um, if they were buying a condo. Yes. They, the scrow items for like your uh, buy-in to the homeowners association. All right, great. I'll cover that. Okay. All right, so what Bill just asked is when your client buys a condo, so what he's asking is for some of my newer people in the room, a lot of times when you buy a condo and the term I use is capital contribution. Capital contribution. So I refer to them as move-in fees with the condo association. Every condo association, every condo association is a little bit different, but they usually have some fees that are due up front the day of closing. It could be capital contribution. It could be a couple months worth of the maintenance fee in advance. It could be just a move-in fee, an application fee because they set you up. When we disclose on the loan estimate, that's not a lender fee. That's not a requirement of ours, ours to disclose that to your client when they get this loan estimate. However, like Bill, it's a great question. If you're helping a buyer buy a condo, you have to add, I always add about $2,000 when I speak to a client that's buying a condo and I explain it to them that you're going to have this extra charge at the closing. It's due to the management company. Be prepared for it. Speak to your realtor, is what I tell them, to get you the information to find out exactly what it is you owe. You have no choice. It's normal when you buy a condo. So I keep it very simple, but I help them understand they have to pay. But that charge will not be seen anywhere until the day of closing. So you want to be heads up with it. You want to be in front of it when you're, when you're selling a condo to somebody so that they're aware of it. Get the deal sold, get it under contract, and they explain it to them because they don't even know it's behind door number two yet. You know what I mean? But when you start, they ask them what closing fees are and buying a condo, you want to bring that up, you know, and, and make sure they're aware of that. So it's a very good question. So can everybody see the screen again? You want to take a no, not no, yet. Yeah. It's it's still spinning, saying that it started screen sharing, <coughs> but it been completed. Uh, yes. Is it um before you said about the PMI, mm -hmm. um, you said it was uh, the $261 and for a conventional, does that change if it's FHA? Yes, It'll be, it's all based off the uh, loan type. And so the they, terms, right? The term will change. So with the FHA, so everybody can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, so Vic asked a question with the PMI, which is why Kevin's trying to figure out the Zoom, the screen share. So with the PMI, it's all based off of if you're doing a conventional loan, which is Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, or you're doing what's called an FHA loan. Okay, we'll start with those three different government agencies. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the PMI factor is based off the loan to value, and then it's based off the credit score. So the more money down, the less the PMI cost is, the less money down, the higher the PMI cost is. And it's based off your credit score, and it's based off of the loan to value. With the FHA, the PMI may never go away. And the reason why it may never go away is it depends on their down payment. So with the PMI, it's the same factor with 4.9% down or less. It's you use 0.85% of the loan amount and you divide that by 12 and that's the monthly PMI. And if they put down more than 5%, it's 0.8% of the loan amount. Um, divided by 12 is the cost of the PMI. If a client puts down 9.9% down or less, they pay PMI, monthly PMI for the life of the loan. If they put down 10% or more, the PMI drops off automatically in 11 years. So that's how the PMI works with an FHA loan. So that's, that's a good question. So PMI with an FHA loan is based off the down payment. If they pay it for the life of the loan or not. The trigger to that is 10% down or more. Now with the FHA, a lot of people, sometimes somebody has to go FHA, even though they're putting down 20% down or more, they still have to pay PMI. The FHA doesn't care about, you're putting down 50%. If you're going FHA, you pay PMI and you pay it for 11 years if you're putting down 50%. Doesn't matter, you have more money down. It's just their rules that they want you to follow. Um, uh, to confirm, there's a 2% fee to New Jersey, even if you're purchasing another home. I, hey, 
Sorry. Mark, I have a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry, some, did someone say something? No, you're up. Okay, sorry. Um, you were talking so fast, I wanna make sure I got this right. So the FHA loan specifically, 20% or more, you still have to pay PMI for 11 years. Yes. Now, the subject you were talking about prior to that, the 10% or more waives the PMI, what loan type were you talking about? So Conventional? Yeah, so, so let, me, let, me, let me go back on that. So with the FHA loan, 10% down or more, PMI is paid for 11 years. PMI is, I'm sorry, PMI is what? Paid for 11 years. You have to pay monthly PMI for 11 years. And that's a standard for every lender? That's, that's an FHA requirement. Okay. That's FHA, okay. That's FHA. There are okay. some programs out there where you don't pay PMI, but I'm not jumping into that today. Okay, and the 9.9% .9 down or less, what did you say about that for the you PMI? You PMI for the life of the loan. Life of the loan, okay, thanks, that's all. You're welcome, you're welcome. Can people, can everybody see the screen again? <coughs> no. All right, so um, I'm not sure what's happening. Um, it's probably on Zoom's end. I would have to restart the meeting. So instead of that, I drop both of the files in the chat box uh, that we're looking at. So you can open those files and follow along um, through that way. So everybody let me know when you're able to do that and we can, we'll, we'll continue. How's everybody doing with being able to see it in the chat? Everybody's good? All right, so nice. yes, thank you. All right, we'll move forward. All right, so I'm gonna assume everybody can see the screen and we are on the page where the loan estimate page two, where it's section F and section H. So I'm talking about what's called prepaid items and escrows for taxes and home insurance. So as mentioned earlier, a client's required to get the home insurance paid in full for the first year prior to closing. And then there's an <coughs> escrow three to four months worth of home insurance at the closing. The, the, the rule is, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the conventional lending guidelines, want the lender to always maintain a two-month cushion with the home insurance and the taxes. So in the home insurance case, it's due annually. So if your client closed today on a house on 12-2, their first mortgage payment is not due until February 1st. So if you count up the months between February 1st and 10 and 12-1, that's 10 payments. We need to have a two month cushion. Insurance is due again on 12 2. So 10 months plus the four month cushion equals 14. 12 months gets sent to the insurance company. There's two months still left in the escrow account. And that cycle starts over again for the next 12 months. And then when it comes due again, 12 months goes out and rinse and repeat. The same thing holds true for real estate taxes. However, real estate taxes are due quarterly. So being due quarterly, the same thing now, client closes today, first payments due on February 1st, well, so are the first quarter taxes for 2022. So at the closing, your client would pay three months worth of taxes for the first quarter. They would have to reimburse the seller for the first two, for, for December and January's taxes, because there's a very good chance the seller paid those already. So you have to reimburse them for now the time that you own the house, and you have to establish the escrow account. So I always prepare the client that they're going to pay between five and six months worth of taxes at the closing, because the same cycle goes through again. Your first mortgage payment is due on two one. If you count up two one three one four one, that's three payments, and they have to start with two months worth of taxes in that account to get rolling. So in that case, the client may pay seven months worth of taxes at the closing if they close today. 
because they have to always have to maintain that two month cushion every three months. Because every three months will be five months in the account, three months comes out, there's two months left, and it starts over. So when you're talking to your clients and they start asking you about how much are my closing fees, you have to you, you have to know what the real estate taxes are. The lower the taxes, it could be cheaper. The higher the taxes, it could be higher. Okay, so we have to keep an eye on that. So any questions regarding escrows before I go on to the section H? Nope. So, okay, so section H is what I jumped back and forth with. So in section H, what's not on this document right now is you would see uh, taxes. Oh, I'm sorry, take that back. What you would see is attorney fee, which we disclosed $1,200 and owner's title insurance. So as mentioned earlier, the owner's title insurance ensures your client's equity in the home if God forbid there was ever a claim against the property. And then their attorney fee is whatever they negotiated with their attorney. So when you total this up, when you get down here, this totals up all the charges, okay? So you see here total cost, $13,000. Then you have a total of $18,392. And if, if the lender were giving a credit, it would be on this line. And you see here, I showed you just a hundred dollar lender credit. So in this case, with the realty transfer tax, okay, the transfer tax up here, our client would need a $60,000 down payment. As you notice here, no deposit is shown. They may have given you a thousand dollars, but we don't, we didn't verify it yet. So it wouldn't be on there. Total closing cost 18,392 because it's a combination of all these charges here. And this client would need $78,392 to purchase. In this scenario, we use taxes of $1,200 a month or roughly $14,000 a year. So when you're talking to your client, six times 1,200 is $7,000 in taxes, $7,200 in taxes paid at the closing. That's a big chunk of change. Title expenses on average, when you get here between all the title charges and the closing agent fee on this purchase price, title's around 3,000 plus the settlement agent fee. So you're pushing around 35, $3,700 for title. So without even getting involved with the home insurance, which is another $1,200, you're at $10,000 in total charges. So some people will use a, a percentage. Well, it's 2% of the purchase price, or it's 3% of the purchase price, or it's 4% of the purchase price. I prefer to give a dollar range. Yeah, 5% is high. So 5% is very, in this case, it'd be $30,000. They would, they would be very nervous. Um, so I usually give a dollar, I usually give a range. So, so my first question always is when somebody's asking me, I, when a pre-approval stage, what are real estate taxes? And they'll give me an idea what they are. And they say, okay, it'll be anywhere from 11 to 15,000. It's a regulated industry. I'm just trying to give you a ballpark. It includes everything soup to nuts. It includes your attorney fee. It includes title work. It includes real estate taxes due at closing. It includes you getting home insurance, everything. So there's no surprises. If you're buying a condo, like we talked earlier, I would add $2,000. And again, the taxes might be cheaper. So the range still might be 11 to 15,000 because usually with a condo in this area, in most cases, taxes are eight or nine thousand dollars a year, or not fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind, you know, when you're doing it. And again, the higher the purchase price, the higher that number goes, because title insurance is based off the purchase price. So the higher the purchase price, the higher that number is, you know. And if they want to, to get a more accurate figure, there they would talk to their attorney, who would confirm with the title company. So that's the first two pages of the loan estimate. The third page <coughs> gets confusing. Oh, chat, I got a chat, hold on. I'll reach your good Good. Hey, Mark, I have one question. Um, I know once you hit like the million dollar listing price, so you have like that one- You have a 1% one one mansion tax. Does that-, does that uh, It would go on here. It would go? Okay. Yes. In yes. what section would that be? Uh, it would be in the top right in section other costs, okay. section E. So what Vic asked was when you sell a house for a million dollars or more, the state gets the buyer for a mansion tax. And that's 1% of the price. So if the price is $1.5 million, it's a $15,000 charge. All right, so now when you look at this loan here, 
Um, this shows you, this part's very, very confusing. But the question your clients will ask a lot is annual percentage rate. And if you notice here, it says 3.556. If I go back to page one, if you recall, the rate was 3.25. So why is the number so much higher? So your client will say to me, what's the APR on the loan? They don't even know what APR stands for, but they ask what the APR is because the guy they work with said, find out what the APR is. So I, I explained to them, hey, your rate is three and a quarter. You're paying zero points. But the APR, annual percentage rate, is going to be a little bit higher because you're putting down 10% and you're paying PMI. And PMI is a cost for you, for you to obtain this loan because you're not putting down 20%. So the, the PMI drives up the APR, as do some of the closing fees, because some of the closing fees, like title insurance and your attorney possibly, those are costs associated with buying the house. You have to, you have to pay those expenses. There are one-time charges, but the APR calculates all those numbers and figures over the life of the loan. All the interest you're paying and everything else over the life of the loan. So that's how that part works. That's how the APR works. But when your client asks what the APR is, Really what they're asking are, am I paying points? So if you see as a lender, I'm gonna age myself now. Years ago, <laughs> you used to read the paper. Bill, I think you're the only one in the room who can appreciate this. <laughs> Thanks, um, Mark. Yeah, yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're about 54. So when, years ago, when you read the paper, as a lender, you'd advertise in the newspaper a rate in the APR. And what did every lender in America do? They put a really low rate and they were a high APR because the average consumer has no idea what APR means. But according to the Department of Banking, that was a legal way to advertise. So what did it make people do? Pick up the phone, call that guy, because he thought he was getting a rate of 1.99. The APR was 3.5, but they didn't know they were paying eight points to get that rate down to 1.99. So there's cost. It, it, it's basically telling me if the numbers aren't very similar, there's some cost involved to get that lower rate. And that's only if you have PMI, right? Or if you're paying points. So the APR is also affected by discount points. So on page two, section A, you'll see where it says uh, loan amount points. So what is a point? Well, if a client's going to pay points, they should be buying the rate down from three and a quarter. The rule, the, the unofficial rule is every point you pay, your client pays, should lower the rate by a quarter percent. Should it's not always true to form every day, okay? So because the interest rates are like stocks, they change every day. So the so the pricing on it could change, but but the rule is you're paying one point to lower the rate by a quarter percent. So what is a point? Well, point in essence is prepaid interest. So you're paying interest in advance to get a lower interest rate. So over the life of the loan, they may save forty dollars a month for paying one point, but in this case, it would cost this client. $5,400 because one point is 1% of the loan amount. So the loan amount is $540,000. So one point would equal $5,400. So now you have to take that savings. And if that savings is $50 a month, they're saving $600 a year. Well, it takes them roughly six years to break even for the money they paid up front at the closing. Now, in some cases, points might be tax deductible. Consult your accountant. Don't tell them it is. Say that in some cases they might be, but you should consult your CPA. But it benefits them over the life of the loan. So if they're going to stay in the house for 30 years, they're going to save $600 a year for 30 years. They're saving $18,000 for a $5,400 investment today. I discourage your clients from paying points because the average person stays in a mortgage for about five to seven years. Now, I say they stay in a mortgage because they're usually refinancing at some point in that time frame as, or they're selling their house. But usually they're doing some, some transaction within five to seven years. So the average person never benefits from paying a point. So when your client asks you what the APR is, if there's a discrepancy, the discrepancy being a quarter percent like this is, or like this is actually 0.3, point, uh, what, 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 doing the math here, 2.25 higher, um, there's fees involved and or PMI. So less than 20% down, that number is never going to be close. It's always going to be a, a, a disparity. 
So that's the loan estimate. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on the loan estimate? I don't want to confuse you too much, but I want to this way you can understand what your client gets. And guys, there are going to be copies of this left here that you can get a copy of it and have it just as a reference point when you're talking to a client. So if your client um, puts 20% down, he's a conventional loan, he'll have a 3.25 APR. The APR will be a little bit higher because the one thing I didn't touch on, guys, and I apologize, go back to page two, prepaid interest. I jumped on you a little bit here. If you can see section F, prepaid interest, you're paying at a rate of three and a quarter for their loan amount. It costs them $48 a day in interest for the loan. So if this loan was to close on December 13th, there's 17 days remaining in the month. Maybe my math is wrong there, but if there's 17 days remaining in the month, they pay $48 a day for the days remaining in the month. That interest also gets factored into the APR because you're, the loan is really 360 equal payments plus $817. So that 817 gets factored into the APR. So unless they're closing on the, the first day of the month and the first payment's due the first day of the following month with 20% down, the APR should always be a little bit higher than the rate. Because we always, we disclose 15 to 17 days usually. You know, we like to leave it in the middle because depending on when the close date is, I don't want to surprise somebody like on this size loan amount, 17 days is $800. Well, if that's 25 days, 25 times 50 is another is $1,200, $1,250. That's a lot of money for somebody. You know, now granted their mortgage payment's not due. If they close on December 5th, their mortgage payment's not due till February 1st, but it's still money they need that day at closing. <coughs> so I've had people say to me, well, if I close at the end of the month, my closing fees are cheaper. They are, but well, your first mortgage payment is due that much sooner. So tip uh, six and one half dozen the other. You know what I mean? In my opinion, you may not have a mortgage payment due for uh, you know less closing fees, but a faster mortgage payment. They have another payroll in between to help out to accumulate more money. Um, all right, so the next document, uh, any questions on the loan estimate guys before I jump to the closing disclosure? Anybody in no. here? Nothing, everybody's good, I see a chat. Uh, at what point in the conversation does a person, so a person receives a loan estimate. We as a lender, from the official date of application, we have three business days to get your client a disclosure package and a loan estimate. So it's three business days or less. You know, sometimes we get it out on the same day, sometimes it's two days, but we have three business days to get it out. Um, all right, Kev, how do I go to the next document? Uh, it's the next tab. Oh, perfect. All right, so guys, in your packet or in the chat, Kevin also shared with you something that says the closing disclosure. So it's in the top left-hand corner when you find the document. This is what your clients get prior to closing. And I'll explain to you how that works in a second once everybody has the document. So if everybody could just let me know you have the document, that'd be great so I don't start too fast. Mark, I gotta jump off. So thanks for everything. Um, could you send me that document? Yeah, send me an email, hon, and then I'll, I'll have it sent to you. Will do, thanks. Bye -bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, so Leo's got it. All right, so, so I'm gonna assume everybody's good. So this is the closing disclosure. So this is how, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about how NJ Lenders works, how we do business. So our philosophy is when the loan gets approved, we send an initial closing disclosure to your client immediately. Why do we do that? Because there's some rules with this document. Your client has to be a receipt of this a minimum of three days before it's closing. Now it, it's kind of silly, because the, the, law, the law, I believe, ideally wants the final closing disclosure to be sent to the client three days prior to closing. But it doesn't specifically say that because in New Jersey, especially New Jersey, we have attorneys involved. They don't even know three days in advance when their loan's closing. 
right? So how can we get it out? And the closings get delayed if this isn't sent out. You can't close. You have three days unless there's extenuating circumstances. And it's got to be really bad. You know, it's it's got to be, it's not, I, I have to take my kids to school. It doesn't work. You know what I mean? It's got to be bad. It's got to be a really hard, a real hardship. So what, what we do at NJ Lenders is the minute the loan's approved, they get the initial closing disclosure. All right. And then I'm going to talk to you about this document here. Some institutions wait till the loan is scheduled and then they send it out. If it goes out, why we send it out immediately is, is because if it goes out seven or more days prior to closing, we don't need a signature on it. We did our job. Because they use the attitude of they're mailing it. So so they're they're if you if you mailed something, you would imagine it takes about seven days to get to them. Hopefully. Yeah, maybe this time of year it doesn't, but hopefully. So and email, we email it. So if we email it, we're figuring to have enough time to also receive it. Now, if we don't send it out and we wait and we're within seven days, then this document needs to be signed and returned to us three minimum of three days prior to closing. So sometimes we get closings move fast and we have to get it signed. It's a three-week closing, loan got approved, we got the closing disclosure out, they have to sign it, return it. They can't date it two days before the closing. It's got to be dated three days or more before the closing. So it's a time sensitive document. So we get a lot of questions on this because it's sent the initial disclosure sent out and none of the numbers are final because it looks like the loan estimate basically just now it says closing disclosure in the top left hand corner. But let's assume right now that this is the final closing disclosure for your client for their closing. So when you go through this now, you'll see on page one, it looks very similar to the loan estimate, right? It talks about the purchase price, the loan amount, the interest rate, what the payment is, when the PMI goes away, what the payment is before, what the payment is after. They're, in this case, these people are escrowing, so it tells you, hey, yes, they're escrowing. But you notice here now, if you recall from the last one, the closing cost figure went down. It says 14,272. Because at this point, we confirmed that your buyer is not responsible to pay that transfer tax. That was on the original loan estimate. So the closing fees went down. It still says cash to close $74,272, okay? So that's page one. Now you go to page two, all right? And this is this page. So as I scroll down, <coughs> here, you guys can see the screen. It's the same as a loan estimate. So again, we can share this with you. If you send me an email, I can share this document with you, but I will have some here left in the office so you can have it to compare. So now you go to page two. If you notice up here, it says, so for those of you that are following that can't see the screen, it says closing cost details in the top left-hand corner. Then it says loan costs. And then carry that line across. It says borrower paid at closing or possibly before closing. And then it might say seller paid at closing before closing and then paid by others. A lot of times those columns are blank to the far right, but sometimes there's figures in there. So you just have to kind of read the document. So this, again, application fee, 1025 now it's the appraisal fee, the closing fees, all in section B, okay? All that's in section B now. So you see all the title charges, um, the appraisal fee, the, the credit report fee, all that kind of came across. Those numbers might change when the attorney does the final one, that, but let's assume that this is the final one and it's accurate, because if you look at the numbers now, they're the same as a loan estimate, because we just want to give you an example. So, so that's the first part of it. Same as a loan estimate, same fees. So here's a total of those charges down here, section D, okay? It's, and if you see right below D, it says loan cost subtotal A, B, and C, which are C, nothing. A, a B is here for 43.20 plus 1,025, and that totals the 53.45. If you, if you see other costs now, again, this mirrors the loan estimate. Remember it said loan, other costs up there, the recording charges. So they pay $340. Now, in this case, it shows they're paying the home insurance, which is right below it, at closing. Your clients have that option. We prefer to be paid before closing. So if we're paid before closing, that $1440 would be in the column to the right, the column directly next to it. Because if you look back up to the top of the page, it says before closing. So it was paid already. Okay. And then the escrows and the interest are the same as a loan estimate, but it's all itemized there. So there's an aggregate on the, if you look at 
the initial escrows, what they would pay. Then you see the aggregate adjustment. That might be money due back to the seller that was paid in advance. They get a credit. The owner's title's on there. There's a total of those charges. Okay, so again, this is the loan estimate just now on a closing document. Lender credit on the bottom, <coughs> excuse me, and that would be their total costs. So you see the 14,272. If you go back to page one on the bottom, where the second line from the bottom where it says closing fees, that number carries through to that first page. You go to page three, and this gives what the loan estimate said they needed, total closing fees, to the final. So it talks about the down payment, talks about the here. Now you see here seller credit, 4185. So something changed. Okay, so we have to figure that out. What was it? Well, it's probably the it's the um it's probably the uh transfer tax. So we go, we scroll down here. Now this looks like this document starts to look like the old HUD one years ago, back before some of you guys, if you've been in the business the last few years, you don't know what a HUD one is. The closing disclosure in 2015, I believe, took over for the for the old HUD one settlement statement. The HUD one settlement statement now breaks down for your client the same that all the numbers. So the top part of that document, honestly, it's nonsense because it's just like summary. Now where it says summary of the transaction, this is like now their receipt. This is what the loan estimate is and the closing disclosure. It's a receipt. You went to the food store, you bought all your all your groceries, you got your receipt. This is a receipt of all their expenses. So page two was a receipt of everything they spent, where all their money went. It's broken down for them. So now you get here where it says summary of the transaction, purchase price, 600,000. All right. So see here, total due, it starts with 614 because it took the 600 grand plus the 14,272 in closing fees. All right. That's the total number. Purchase price is 600. Closing fees are 14,272. So you see how it adds up? Okay. That's, that's where that number came from because it adds up. It's very weird. So in this case, our client didn't give a deposit, but if they gave a deposit, section L01, it would show deposit given. It would show how much money they gave, and it would be listed there. So it'd be a credit to them because they gave that deposit. The loan amount's next, a $540,000 loan amount. And again, simple calculations, total due from borrower at closing, 614,272. So what is that telling you? If it were a cash buyer, that's how much money they would need. Because you're paying 600,000 plus their closing fees, they'd need 614,272 spot 36. But these guys are taking out a loan. They're taking out a $540,000 loan. So total money cash to close from our client is $74,272.36. Now on the right-hand side of this page, if you notice here, this is the seller side of the page. So in this scenario, it's blank, but if they're paying off a mortgage, you'd have pay off a first lien, pay off of a second lien, um, any deposit that they received already, and then it would say down here what they would walk away with. So here it just says cash to sell or $600,000 because they didn't have any closing fees, but real estate commission is a closing fee. So it'd be on there, okay? or or uh, if they owed money to the town for taxes, or if they had an open water bill, or if they were giving a credit, see section uh, N08, seller credit would be there. And then over here, where the adjustments are, would be, it, we see here where it says seller credit, it'd be listed here, and it'd be a credit to your people here. So again, if you just kind of read down this document, it's not complicated, but you have to take the time to go through every line. You know what I mean? To try to understand what everything is. So, and so that's the summary of it. Page four is a bunch of nonsense. I have to be honest with you. Does, <laughs> does the loan have a demand feature? No. Is it assumable? No. What does that mean? Well, I'll start with assumable. Can you, can I assume the mortgage from the people I'm buying the house from? Most mortgages are not assumable. An FHA mortgage is assumable. But it's not just like here, take my mortgage over because I have a low interest rate and you get it. They have to qualify for that mortgage. And if you only owe $200,000 on that mortgage and you're selling house for 400,000, 
They have to put down the difference. So I've never handled an assumable loan in 28 years for somebody, you know, because they, they don't fit it. You know what I mean? Um, a demand feature, what does that mean? 10, uh, if you read above it, it says has a demand feature, which permits your lender to require early repayment of the loan. You should, and then it says you should review your note, meaning the note is the repayment terms of the loan. That, break, that breaks down the repayment terms of the loan. So if the note said 15, it's a 30 year term, 15 years of equal payments. After 15 years, this balance is due in full. That's a demand feature. There's a balloon feature in the loan, it balloons. There's a demand feature. Most loans today don't have a demand feature, okay? It tells you that if you have a late payment right below it, there's a 5% fee on the principal and interest after 15 days late. So that you, have, you have 15 days to make the payment without paying a late fee. So they give you that 15 day grace period. If you're 30 days later more, if you're 31 days later more, it shows up on your credit report. So you can make, you can be 15 days late in making your payment from the due date and not affect your credit at all. If once you get past 30 days, they have to report it. The loan, does the loan have what's called negative amortization? It does not, that box is checked. Again, that's an old school term. You don't see negative amortization loans that often anymore. They're, they might even be outlawed, I think, at this point. If not, I know in New Jersey, you don't see them too often. And again, Bill and I might be the only two people in the room that know what a negative amortization loan is. Um, can you make partial payments? No. Some people think that they can make a partial payment. What does that mean? That they can not make the full payment this month, catch up next month, or pay $1,000 a week towards their loan. The bank doesn't want that. Unless you work it out with the servicer that you're going to do a bi-weekly mortgage and you're sweeping the money out of your account every 14 days or 15 days, you have to make the full payment when you make the payment. There are no, <coughs> can I make a partial payment? Can I make... Can I cut it up? I people say to me, "Well, I get paid weekly. Can I make? Uh, can I pay my mortgage every week?" No, you know you, you can't. It's due monthly. Um, the security in interest is the property they're buying. If, if you go to the top of the page, the property address on this house was one two three Main Street. Um, may you lose your property if you don't. May, you may lose your property if you don't make your payments. So everybody's made aware of this. They just never read. You know what I mean? <laughs> But this is what they get. So you can read through this and see what see what it says. Uh, you will have an escrow account, also called an impound or trust account, another word for it. And in this case, our clients are escrowing, so that box is checked. If they weren't escrowing, of course, that box wouldn't be checked. Gives them a little bit of a breakdown of what it is here they, as an example. Um, and then the last page, again, goes back to the APR. And this is where it can get intimidating for your clients. So if you look at it, they're, they're borrowing, your client is borrowing $540,000, okay? So the amount finance calculation there, we see 537.079, why doesn't it say 540? When you calculate the APR, a couple of the closing fees are deducted from the loan amount. And then they add back in the interest you're paying over the life of the loan, and that's how they calculate the, the, the um, APR. So in this case, this client, if they were to pay their mortgage over 30 years, they borrowed $540,000, they're paying back $871,518. That's a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Now, 15 year mortgage would be a lot less in interest, but it's a higher payment because you're paying more money to principal. And then, you know, the state law may protect you from liability, unpaid balance, if you refinance, take additional. What that's talking about if there was, um, uh, well, that's talking about if you had foreclosure. So, if your lender foreclosed on the property, the foreclosure does not cover the amount of the unpaid principal. As a lender, we can put a deficiency judgment against you as a, as a homeowner because you didn't pay back the debt. Most cases it's forgiven, but the person could be responsible for it. Um, and then here it talks tax deductions. If you borrow more than this property is worth, the interest on the loan amount above property is not deductible. Um, you should consult a tax advisor, you know, and that's why I talked to you guys about earlier about the points, you're not an expert. You're a real estate expert, you're not a tax accountant. You're not a mortgage expert, you're a real estate expert. So you give advice to mortgages and you can say, hey, it might be tax deductible to confirm with your tax consultant. And then down here, it just talks about the parties involved. 
the lender, the real estate people. Um, Ronnie and Bill sold this house, I guess, here. Um, and then this is the title company that was used at the time. And then the people signed it here. And then this is a quick summary of estimated escrow property costs over one year. And then that is the document. And that's what they get. And they go home with that, with the keys to the house. And that's it. So I see a question in the chat. Uh, have to hop. Okay, you're welcome. And that's it. Any questions before we close this out? Is good. Yeah, thank you. All right, you mom. You got it. Use eleven to fifteen thousand. Somebody asked you. Okay. You know. Have we ever come across a muscle borrower that doesn't want to pay interest and can't pay interest because it's considered usury? Yes, they ninety five percent of the time they get a mortgage anyway. But there are a few banks out there that understand it. They don't call it interest, but they're still paying a fee. So <laughs> I've had one. Yes, yeah. crazy. You come across? We don't do it. So we don't do those types of loans. But yes, I have. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, bye. All right, you guys save those because it's just. If a client talks about it, it's just a reference point. Yeah. Like I say about the lender. So when a client tells me to shop around about the lender, they send it to me. I print it out and say it on my bulletin board, and I know what they charge. Sure. So I know what their fee 